As I read the gospel lesson, the risen Christ is fully in our midst through his word. And I'm going to invite you to rise and welcome and greet Christ in our midst here today as we hear from Mark's gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 21. We've been doing um, prior to Easter and then since Easter, we've been looking at different encounters with Jesus. This is one of the early encounters with Jesus, um, just as his formal and public ministry is beginning. Hear now the word of the Lord. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, what is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. My brothers and sisters, this is the living word from our living God. Let us all say, thanks be to God. And now please be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray together. Holy God, your word has authority over our lives. Speak to us now your words of holiness, of love and mercy and grace. Speak to us your demands that we too be like Jesus. We offer these words in his name and for the sake of his continuing work in the world. Amen. For decades... In Denver, Pennsylvania, folks who lived within five or six miles of the hat factory set their clocks by the factory's sirens, which sounded off throughout the day. At 5.30 a.m., the timekeeper set off a wake-up siren. Later came sirens at starting time, and then noon lunch time, and then again at quitting time. After many decades, probably a whole generation of people, the siren system was finally disbanding. And a friend was reminiscing with the timekeeper about the significance and responsibility of his job. This person asked the timekeeper, what did you use to determine the exact time? <clears throat> With a twinkle in his eye, the man reached into his pocket and pulled out his precision timepiece. It was a child's Mickey Mouse watch. Some experts are not as authoritative as they may seem. You might say today's scripture lesson is about authority. They were in Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. Jesus went to the synagogue to worship and teach on Sabbath every week. It was his holy habit. He never missed. It was part of who he was. 
and as followers of Jesus, we should also follow that same pattern, shouldn't we? I imagine the place was packed as word of this dynamic new itinerant preacher was getting around town. The crowd grew each week to hear Jesus. He sat in the seat of Moses, which was the synagogue's equivalent to this pulpit. Week after week, his hearers were astounded, spellbound by Jesus' teaching. He was particularly unusual, this one. He didn't teach the way other religious leaders taught. Typically, scribes or rabbis appealed to external authorities in order to substantiate their teaching. According to Rabbi Gamaliel, they would say, According to Rabbi Hillel, or according to Rabbi Shammai, they would say. But Jesus was a different kind of teacher altogether. He sat down in the seat of Moses and declared, this is the way it is. This is the word of the Lord. His teaching came from deep within him. It was his word, not someone else's word. I imagine people wondered, where did his authority come from? An acting workshop was conducted by a seasoned and widely acclaimed actor, and when asked to give an oration, he stood, cleared his throat, and gave a, flaw, a flawless recitation of the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. When he finished, he received a polite applause. And then he nodded to an elderly priest there in the audience who stepped forward and recited the very same words. When he was finished, there was no polite applause. In fact, you could hear a pin drop, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house. When asked what made the difference, the actor replied, well, there's no doubt I know the 23rd Psalm all right. I know it backwards and forwards, but the padre here, he knows the shepherd. Jesus taught with the authority about God because Jesus intimately knew God. His life was entirely dedicated to knowing and doing God's will. So when Jesus spoke, he taught as one having authority. The original Greek word for authority is used twice in this passage. It's exousia, which literally means out of one's being. Jesus speaks out of his own being, out of who he was and where he came from. And people could sense it. They were impressed by his teaching, but they were even more impressed and amazed when the man with an unclean spirit entered the synagogue and the demon within the man cried out, what have you do to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Now let's look at the cultural implications of this story. Today, it is acceptable for anyone with an unclean spirit to enter a church. We readily say, well, no one is perfect, don't we? And we also declare as Christians that we are all sinners in need of God's grace, and at the same time, we are saints who are saved by God's grace. And if the church is going to be faithful to the gospel, we will continue to humbly and actively invite all persons into our midst. But in Jesus' time, you did not go to the synagogue. 
to be forgiven. Synagogue was only for the upright and the righteous. You were expected to clean up your act before you entered the gates of the sanctuary. Now imagine this scene. This unclean, unrighteous man bursts into the synagogue right in the middle of Jesus' teaching, and I'm guessing everyone there knew who this guy was. They'd probably seen him wandering around town. They'd probably groaned in disgust. This guy had a bad reputation. His life was totally out of control. This man was a bad influence. His presence was going to pollute the sanctity of their holy space. Chances are the ushers had already begun to escort the man out of the building before he could make too much trouble, but apparently the ushers weren't fast enough. The demon within this man saw Jesus and recognized who Jesus truly was. As an aside, Jesus' disciples still don't get it. They're not really sure who Jesus really is, but the unclean spirit within this man knows exactly who Jesus is. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. <clears throat> There's a certain power, I think, in naming something or someone, isn't there? By naming Jesus, the demon was trying to get the upper hand of the situation, trying to put Jesus in his proper place. It was like saying, phooey, you're nothing but a country bumpkin from a small backwater town of Nazareth. You have no power over me. But Jesus commanded the unclean spirit, be silent and come out of him. Well, my friends, the translators are much too polite here. <laughs> the literal translation of Jesus' words would be more like, shut up and get the devil out of him. Knowing that it was beaten, the unclean spirit obeyed Jesus. With a loud scream, that demon sent the man into convulsions and then left the scene. Let me ask you, do you believe in demons today? I do. I believe that they're just as real today as they were in Jesus' time. Oh, we may call our demons by different names like compulsive gambling, alcohol or drug addiction, eating disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders, post-traumatic stress syndrome, schizophrenia, depression, narcissism, bigotry, and greed, to name just a few. Whatever modern-day names we give them, our modern-day demons cause just as much suffering as did the demons in Jesus' day. Day, they grab a life and they take control over it. And how do we tend to deal with today's demons? Well, we say, maybe if I just close my eyes, it'll go away. <gasps> or let's just ignore it and everything will be okay. But we know that doesn't work, don't we? The demons today are too real to ignore and too strong to try and battle on our own, and so we succumb to them time and time again. The truth is, under our own power, we cannot defeat the demons that surround us, and we cannot defeat the demons within us. But I have good news for you this morning. There is help 
there is hope for all of us. Long ago, Jesus came to expose and overcome evil. He wasn't playing Mickey Mouse, mind you. His authority was irrefutable because it was of God. His words had the power to heal and change lives forever, and they still can, which means Jesus can set us free from the evil forces that control us. If we will yield our lives to him, Jesus can banish the things that hold us hostage. With him in charge of our lives, the demons of this world would lose their power to control and destroy us. An example. A certain military man had been a heavy drinker for 35 years years. He had the temperament of a cruel and vicious drill sergeant long after he became a colonel, but the man encountered Christ, accepted Jesus as his Savior, and his whole life was changed. He was speaking before a group of medical people told them of his personality change, how he was now temperate while once he had been intemperate, how he was now considerate as he had once been severe, how he was now compassionate as once he had been selfish and self-serving and overly demanding. A psychiatrist stood in the crowd and protested, surely, sir, you could not have such a radical transformation at your age. And then this psychiatrist went on to explain that personalities are so firmly set in early life, no one can really ultimately change. Well, replied the colonel, That may be true, but this I know. I am under new management now. I answer to another authority, the highest and truest there is. Now, don't you think that is what happened to this man with the unclean spirit. After his encounter with Jesus, his life was now under new management. And my friends, it can happen to you as well. Is there something in your life that has control over you? Something you just can't seem to shake? It may be fear or anxiety. It may be a painful memory. It may be guilt or shame. It may be an ungodly attitude or behavior that makes you feel unclean as you come before God. In a few moments, as we come to the table of the Lord, I invite all of you to come as a sinner in need of God's grace. And we're going to take a time of confession before we move into our communion time. Receive the bread and wine of redemption and know that the power of Christ and his authority to cleanse you is there for you in every part of your life. Turn all of your life over to Jesus so you can say, thanks be to God, I am under new management now. Amen.